Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's just read one verse. 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse number 8. Verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. The Bible says that we've got an adversary. His name is the devil or Satan. The Bible says he walks about seeking to devour us. I started a message last Sunday evening and didn't get finished. I believe it would be a series of messages. This is actually the second in that series. The title of the series is Satan's Tactics. Satan's Tactics. The title of this message is The Master Illusionist. The Master Illusionist. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the good book to preach from. I thank you for every person that's here. Now, Father, I pray that you'd accomplish your good work in this place today. It's already been prayed that the Spirit of God would rest upon me and upon us. God, that we might be used of you today to speak the Word of God. That sinners might be saved and saints might be challenged. And I pray that that and much more will be accomplished today. Help us to learn something about the devil that would make us more capable of defending ourselves and, and defeating him. And we'll do our best to keep the praise for all that you do, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake we do pray. Amen. The title of the message is The Master Illusionist. Here Peter is cautioning, commanding those that are reading this epistle to be wary of their adversary, the devil, for he walketh about as a lion seeking whom he may devour. That means to destroy. The devil is our greatest enemy in this flesh. He desires to do three things, according to John. He desires to kill, to steal, and to destroy. His desire is to steal your soul. Not that he gets any credit for a soul stolen. The only thing he can do is damn your soul so that you'll wind up in the same lake of fire that he will wind up in. But he also wants not only to damn your soul, he also wants to destroy your life. And shortly thereafter, while it's in the midst of destruction, he wants to kill you. So his desire is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He's the most powerful foe, but he's not invincible. He can be defeated. Amen. Jesus Christ <laughs> defeated him, and we, through the power of Jesus Christ, can also defeat the devil. Listen to what I'm about to say, because it actually is hard for me to say it. There's two things that are required for us to defeat the devil. Number one, you've got to be saved. But salvation alone will not defeat right. the devil. And now it's hard for me to say that because I believe salvation is all in all. But the Bible actually tells us that there's another commodity that's needed. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 11, Paul writes, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So number one, you've got to be saved. Number two, you've got to have some knowledge. You've got to know how the devil works. What Paul is saying in that verse is ignorance breeds defeat. You may well be saved, but that doesn't mean the devil is going to leave you alone. You may well be going to heaven, but that doesn't mean you're defeating him. As a matter of fact, it's still highly likely that he is doing battle with you and defeating you. In this series of messages, my goal is to point to some scriptures and try to help us to understand how Satan works. And the title of the message again this morning is Satan the master illusionist. Four thoughts that I'd like to give to you this morning. Number one, Satan is a spiritual being. Satan <coughs> is a spiritual being. Now, I'm not going to be deep in this series of messages, but everything that I say is going to be very, very important. And the fact that he's a spiritual being is important because it gives us an understanding of how Satan is going to work against us. Now, you have to understand, he's far more powerful than we are. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 2, God speaking to that writer compares angelic beings to carnal beings, angels to human beings. And he makes this statement in Hebrews 2, 7. Thou madest him, man. God made man a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and did it set him on the works of thy hands. Now, this is an important thing to understand. That Bible verse is saying that on the plane of strength and abilities, angels 
have more strength and abilities than man. God made man lower than the angels. There's four forms of life that immediately come to my mind. There's plant life. It's on the bottom. There's animal life. It's a step above. Then there's human life. It's a step above. And then there's angelic life. And it's a step above. So on this scale of these four animals, these, excuse me, these four forms of life, angels are more powerful than our human beings. In most everything that a man would try to do, an angel could do it better. When it comes to being stronger in power, angels are stronger. When it comes to being greater in knowledge, angels are greater in knowledge. When it comes to being wiser in understanding, angels are wiser. When it comes to being swift in mobility, angels are more swift. On almost every comparison between a human being and an angelic being, the angels are going to be superior. However, there's one problem that they have when it comes with angels or spiritual beings or demons dealing with human beings. The only way that a demon can directly attack a human being is he has to somehow take an earthly form. He's a spiritual being. So no matter what you've seen in Hollywood, no matter what you've imagined in your mind, he as a spiritual being cannot commence a direct attack against an earthly being. The only way that he can do that is he has to somehow influence or somehow possess an earthly vessel. Now, you can take your entire Bible, start the book of Genesis and go all the way through the book of Revelation and what you'll find out is that demons particularly want to have a physical body to live in. You can see that through the entire scriptures. They prefer to have a human body to live in. But they will settle for an animal's body to live in. They desire to be inside of a human being so bad that in some cases, many demons, hundreds of demons, perhaps even thousands of demons have entered into just one human being. In the book of Mark, chapter number 5, the Bible tells us of a day when Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee to a place called Galeria. And there in those mountains, he met a man that was possessed, not with a demon, but with demons, plural, an S on the end. And as Jesus is having a conversation, not really with the man that's inhabited by these demons, but with the demons themselves, he asks the demons, what is your name? And the demons reply, our name is Legion, for we are many. Now, it's possible for a demon to lie. They're kind of known for that kind of stuff. But the name that they gave to themselves was the name Legion. Legion is actually a military term. It's a division, a group, a, 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 a squad, if you please, of soldiers in the Roman army. And at that time, at Jesus' lifetime, history tells us that a legion numbered 6,000 soldiers. Now, I don't know for sure if there were 6,000 demons inside this one man or not, but there were many inside of this one man. And their desire is to always be inside of a human body. Now, when I preach, I want to give you Bible truth, but I want you to learn something that might help you. I hope you start to understand something. There are forces in this world today. There are demons in this world today. And they're looking for a body either to influence or to out and out possess. That means they're looking for someone that they can take control of. Now when you look at a human being, like you look at me, you see Carl Hall, and you think this body is Carl Hall. Well, this may be Carl Hall's body, but this isn't Carl Hall. The real Carl Hall is on the inside of this body. Always remember, we have a body but we are a soul. It's that soul on the inside that's eternal, that lives forever. That's the part of us that thinks, remembers, loves, laughs. All of that is the eternal part. When you die, the body goes to the grave, but you go somewhere else. You are an eternal being. Now the body 
is controlled by the soul and the spirit that's on the inside. This body wants to eat all the time. But every once in a while, I tell it no. The Carl Hall on the inside says, no, you don't need to do that. I tell this body, it's time for you to go to bed. I, Carl Hall, the soul, tells this body, it's time for you to get up. This body is directed when to laugh. It's directed when to get angry. It's directed what to do when it is angry. All of those things, none of them are determined by the body, by what you're seeing. They're all determined by the soul, the spirit that's on the inside of this body. One of the great dangers, even in Christian circles today, is people surrendering control of their body. Hypnotism, seances, fortune telling, horoscopes. All of these are open, these and many others, are you allowing forces outside of you to control your body? Being drunk, being high on drugs, that's you surrendering your body, the control of your body to forces, to powers other than yourself. And that, my friend, is a terribly dangerous thing to do. It's like standing outside and shooting a flare up to the demons of this world saying, at this moment, this body is open. Anything, anybody can come in and influence or possess this body. And one of the problems that we're having in this day that we live in is that demons are influencing and controlling human beings, perhaps more than they have done at least since the days that Jesus walked on this earth. You say, oh, preacher, you're crazy. Oh, preacher, you're imagining things. Am I really? I looked up this morning, as a matter of fact, on one of the websites that I check from time to time to find out how many mass killings there's been in the United States. Not in this year, not in this month. Well, this is the first day of the month, but this past weekend. In this past weekend, since Friday night, they count one, two, three, four, five mass killings that have taken place in our country. First one was on Friday night in Baltimore, Maryland. A woman was killed along with three others as a possible retaliation to a previous stabbing. In Mobile, Alabama, Friday night, 10 people ranging in age from 15 to 18 were injured at a high school football game as a fight escalated out of control. Saturday, August the 31st, in Frederick, Maryland, four people were injured after an argument escalated. August the 31st, Saturday, at Charlotte, North Carolina, a man was killed and three others were injured at a University of North Carolina at Charlotte off-campus apartment complex. And the one that's made the most news was yesterday in Odessa and Midland, Texas. At least five people were killed and 21 were wounded in a series of mass shootings. Friend, if you don't think that what I'm preaching is going on in this world today, you're living in a make-believe world. The truth is, it is the demonic forces of this world that are both influencing and possessing bodies, human bodies, which are causing so much of the violence, and let's just say so much of the stupidity that's running rampant in our world today. Could you have ever imagined that so much foolishness could exist inside of a nation which was once so great? Why is it happening? It's happening because Satan is a spiritual being. You may not know it, but Peter was warning us many years ago. He's walking about as a roaring lion. And his goal is to kill, is to steal, and is to destroy. And I don't care whether you're a Christian or whether you're a lost person. He may not be able to steal a Christian's soul, but he can sure destroy and kill his life. And for a lost person, you risk not just your earthly life, you risk well your eternal soul. Understand Satan is a master illusionist. First thought that I give to you is Satan is a spiritual being. The second thought that I give to you is Satan tricks people into hurting themselves. Satan tricks people into hurting themselves. Interesting, the best example that we have of this is at the beginning of the Bible. Take your Bible, if you would, go to the book of Genesis chapter number 3. 
Genesis chapter number 3. The story that we're going to read, the historical account that we're going to read, is the story of the fall of man. In Genesis chapter 3, verse number 1, even before I read the first verse, I want to point out that for Satan to communicate with Eve, he first had to take an earthly vessel. The Bible says the vessel that he'll take is the form of a serpent. He will possess an animal so that he can communicate with Adam. Well, there were only two human beings at that time, and that's who he wanted to, to attack, so he couldn't possess either one of those bodies, so he chose to possess an animal. With that in mind, read verse number 1, Genesis 3, 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now notice... Inside that serpent is the devil. That's the devil inside of there. Why is he inside of that animal skin? Because he's a spiritual being. And the only way that he can directly attack a physical being is he must somehow possess an earthly vessel. He took control of, of that serpent's body. But notice what he asked. He asked, did God really say that? The question, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the earth. He says, did God really say that? The implication is, did God really mean that? Uh, God gave you a command. He says, the whole earth is yours. You can eat of every tree, of every vine that you choose to eat from. However, there's one tree in the middle of the garden. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that. He went further. He says, don't even touch that tree. And then the devil comes along in the form of a serpent to ask this question, is that really what God said? Meaning, is that really what God meant? Let me help you out here. If you find it in the Bible, God really did say it. And if you find it in the Bible, God really didn't mean it. God didn't write a book that he didn't mean. The Bible is a book. It's called the Word of God. If you want to put an S on the end, that's all right. It's the words of God. And if it's in the Bible, God really did say it. And yes, God really did mean it. The story goes on, verse number 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Verse number 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now there's three seeds of doubt that Satan used that day on Eve. First he said, did he really say it? Did God really say that? What he meant was, did God really mean it? The third thing that he said is, you think God will really do it? Did God really say it? Did he really mean it? Will he really do it? Will you really die if you touch that tree? Will you really die if you eat that fruit? Those three thoughts, those three seeds of doubt caused Eve to do something. She was deceived. She was tricked. An illusion was put forth on her. She ultimately reached up, grabbed the tree, plucked the fruit, and ate of the forbidden fruit. Now, would you notice, the devil didn't touch the tree. The devil didn't touch the fruit. The devil didn't touch Eve. The devil didn't touch Eve's lips. What the devil did was, he tricked Eve into hurting herself. That's how the devil often works. Now, if you are an unsaved person, if you're a lost person, he may possess you. He may so subdue the you that's on the inside that he actually can control your body even without your permission. He could possess you. The man I spoke of in Mark chapter 5, he was possessed. He was no longer controlling his own vessel. The demons on the inside were. If you're a lost person or a saved person, either one, he can influence you. I don't believe he can possess a saved person, but I do believe whether you're lost or saved, he can influence you. Through the words and actions of others, he can plant thoughts and ideas into your head to cause you to do things. And what you're seeing here in Genesis chapter number 3 is exactly how that works. 
Here was Eve, a pure woman with no sin, and he planted within her a desire. It was an ungodly desire, a desire she never would have had on her own, but with three phrases. Is that really what he said? Is that really what he meant? Do you think that's really what he'll do? He not only tricked Eve into hurting herself, he tricked Eve into damning the entire human race. Understand, the devil tricks people into hurting themselves. Let's spend a few moments remembering. Some of you have led some pretty hard lives. First time you took your first drag on a cigarette. How did the devil do that? Did somebody come up and say something to you like, hey, it's not as bad as what they say. Hey, you might cough for a while, but you'll get used to it. Don't worry about that. Look at me. I smoke all the time and I'm fine. You know what that was? That was the devil coming to you with these same three thoughts. Is that really what they said? Is that really what they meant? Do you think they'll really do that to you? First time you took your first drug, did somebody come up to you and say something along the line and say, hey, it's not really that bad. I know what the commercials are. I know what the average, but they're not really. Look at me. I've been doing drugs for years and I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. You're bloodshot. You're, you don't have a job. You, you can't think straight. And, and you're trying to, to lie to sell me a false bill of goods. And you probably don't have a, 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 a mind that will think straight. But you're trying to take me down this wrong path. What are they doing with the same Thoughts that the devil used in the Garden of Eden. Uh, do you think they really said that? Do you think they really meant that? Do you think that will really happen? They latched hold of you and they pulled you down into the very pits of sin. Understand, these are the same tactics that the devil uses even into this very day. Just four thoughts this morning. Number one, Satan is a spiritual being. Number two, Satan tricks people into hurting themselves. Number three, Satan can trick almost anyone into serving him. Satan can trick almost anyone into serving him. Think again about the Garden of Eden. In order to get Eve to do what he wanted to do, he had to possess a serpent. But if you're still there, you can look at chapter 3, verse number 6, and you'll notice the last few words. The Bible says, she did eat, and she gave to her husband who ate also. You know who Satan used to get Adam to sin? It wasn't a serpent. He used Eve. He used Adam's wife to get Adam to sin. Satan was after Jesus when he was walking on this earth. You remember up in the upper room? It was Peter who said, be it far from you. This shall not be unto you. Jesus had been talking about the cross, about dying for the sins of man. And Peter comes up and says, be that far from you. This will never happen. You remember what Jesus' reply was? Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou savorest not the things that be of God. You understand? The devil can use almost anyone to trick them into doing wrong things. It shouldn't surprise us. The Bible tells us in the book of Corinthians that Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Think again about the times in your life where you chose some wrong roads. Who was there to encourage you down that wrong path? Was it your friend? Or was it your parents? Was it some school teacher? Was it a college professor? Was it a preacher who stood in the pulpit? I'm thinking today about uh, when was it that you were challenged to quit believing the Bible is the Word of God? So many who sit in the churches today, they just don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Who first challenged you that way? Was it your parents? Did they tell you, hey, that's a pretty good book, but you can't believe everything that's on the inside? Was it a school teacher? Hey, you really can't believe that creation story. We understand everything came during the Big Bang Theory. Or maybe you did go to college and you got on an ultra-high level 
of doubt and sarcasm concerning the Word of God. And you actually had college professors with long initials behind their name. And they sold seeds of doubt concerning the Word of God, even the existence of God. Who was it that first planted the thoughts of doubt that God doesn't exist, that the Bible is not true, that homosexuality is all right? That promiscuous sex is just an acceptable thing. Who was it that told you it's all right to smoke, it's all right to drink, it's all right to cuss? Who planted those thoughts in your mind? You go back and think for a moment. Whoever that person was on that day during that hour, they were the devil's servant. You say, well, preacher, it happened to be my pastor. I want you to know there's many preachers who stand on the pulpit and they appear to glisten in the glory of God, but they're spewing the very bowel of hell itself. You and I need to understand, the devil can trick almost anyone into serving him. Here's the problem that we have. When we think about a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's the terminology that the Bible uses concerning these people that the devil uses. When we think of a wolf in sheep's clothing, we're still thinking about the wolf. We're thinking, well, uh, this false prophet, this person who's trying to take me down the wrong path, uh, they should be growling and snarling and biting. Friend, you have to understand, the Bible doesn't describe them as a wolf. It describes them as a wolf in sheep's clothing. The sheep's clothing means they put on an attire that's not truly theirs. They're charming. They're charismatic. They're friendly. They're compassionate. Everything about them makes you think you ought to trust them. Hey, that's the sheep's clothing, but there's still the wolf on the inside. Whoever it was that encouraged you to go out clubbing, whoever it was that encouraged you, how much can you drink? Whoever it was that took you to your first seance, whoever it was who first enticed you, seduced you into some immoral relationship, whoever that person was at that moment, maybe they're not possessed with the devil, but at that moment they are the tool of the devil. Satan is either possessing them or he is influencing their mind. Now let's take it just one more step. How many people in the world has the devil used you to direct down the wrong path? An innocent conversation, you're listening to your best friend and they're talking about the problems inside their home and you make the statement, I'd leave that man if it was me. You're thinking along the lines of what you ought to be doing with your money and you say, hey, it's my money. If I want to go have a good time, I'll I'll spend it any way I want to. How many people have you unwittingly or maybe wittingly stood in the devil's stead and guided down an evil and a wrong? None of us are perfect human beings, but we need to understand this is not just a human warfare that we're fighting. There are spiritual entities. There are spiritual powers. The Bible describes the devil. He is walking around like a roaring lion. He's looking to see what body he can influence, what mind he can influence, what person he can possess. And it doesn't matter whether you allow him to use you for five minutes, five years, or 50 years. The ultimate end is he can cause ruination in your life, and he can cause damnation and ruination in the lives of many, many others. He can do that without without ever laying a hand on you. He can do that because he's the master illusionist. He tricks you into hurting yourself. Oftentimes, As a preacher, I encourage Christians that you need to have a whole new thought process, a whole new way of life. You see, when you got saved, it wasn't just your soul that needed to be converted. Everything about you needed to be converted. The way you think, the way you talk, the way you dress, uh, the very motives that have moved you in your entire life, every aspect of your existence needs to be brought up before God and needs to be reexamined in the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you talk like you used to talk, you're not talking right. If you have the same goals you used to have, you've got the wrong goals. If you dress like you used to dress, you're not dressing right. If these are the ways that you were before your salvation, there ought to be a change. That expression, it flows through me every time I use that word. If there's been no change in your life, there's been no Christ in your life. What type of change has taken place since you have claimed to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Just four points this morning. Satan is 
a spiritual being. Satan tricks us into hurting ourselves. Satan can trick almost anyone. But fourth and last, Satan can be defeated. He can be defeated. But it really depends on who you are. Now listen to me real careful. By and large, most of you today are going to tell me that you're saved. And I hope that that's a true statement. That every person in here truly knows that they are born again. But if you're here this morning and you're not saved, you cannot defeat the devil. I'm going to say it again. If you're here and you're not saved, you can't defeat the devil. You can't stop him from attacking you. You can't stop him from attacking your family. You can't stop him from attacking your friends. You can't stop him from attacking your community. You can't stop him from attacking your nation. You don't have any authority over him, any way to resist him, not one, not at all. As a matter of fact, the very fact that you still have a sound mind, a reasonably healthy body, and a life to live indicates that you are enjoying the mercy of God because it's just the mercy of God that's keeping the devil from dragging you, kicking and screaming down the very pits of hell right now where you sit. We like to think of ourselves as pretty good people, and I suppose when we find the lowest dregs of society, we can shine ourselves up pretty good. But it's all by the mercy of God. You're already the devil's. Your soul's already lost. You're going to hell. There's not a nice way to say that. You're going to hell. And at any moment, if the, if the devil could get permission from God, he'd ruin your life. He'd ruin your mind. He'd ruin your wealth. He'd ruin your health. He'd ruin your testimony. He'd ruin your marriage. He'd ruin your kids. He'd do anything and everything that he could. The only thing that's keeping him from doing that is the very mercy of God. And the Bible tells us in the book of Peter, the same book that we're reading here, why God does that. It's because God is long-suffering and he's not willing that any should perish. Devil, God has kept the devil off of your back, hoping, wanting you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. It's all been by the mercy of God thus far. But now listen to me. Listen to me very carefully. The closer we get to the last day, the less the mercy of God is going to protect you. The Bible describes the increase in demonic activity as we get closer to that time period. And it's taking place. As I said, if you're not seeing it, you're not looking. You're blinded because you, you can see it every single day in the society that we live in. And the truth of the matter is, many people are being influenced by demons even that are sitting inside the churches today. Not all that sit inside the churches are saved. Many, even many of them that are have never been taught Satan's tactics, so they don't know how to fight the devil. They are ignorant of his devices, so they are at the mercy of Satan himself. But if you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart, the only thing you've got keeping you out of hell and out of Satan's throes is the mercy of God. You can't defeat him, you can't save yourself, and you can't save anybody else. Can we defeat the devil? Well, it depends on who we are. If you're lost, no, you can't. Can we defeat the devil if we're saved? The answer is yes and no. Yes, you can keep him from destroying you. You can. If you're saved, and if you will learn the things that the Word of God teaches, you can keep the devil from destroying you. But even you cannot keep the devil from destroying your friends, your family, your community, and your country. You can help your friends, your family, your country, your community. You can point them towards Jesus Christ. But every human being must make their own decision. As badly as you might want to rescue your kids, as badly as you might want to rescue your parents, as badly as you might want to rescue your co-workers, you can't keep the devil off of them because every human being has to make their own decision. I'll go a step further. You can defeat him, but you can't even keep him off of you. The devil's going to come back. It's not like you bloody his nose once and send him off to the far sides of the earth and he's going to stay gone forever. No, he'll come back. He'll fight with you again. That's just the warfare that we're in, which means as believers, we have to understand this is a perpetual battle. We must do all that we can do for our souls, our sanctification, 
and for the souls and the sanctification of our kids. It's hard to acknowledge how much this world has changed. But if you're at least 50 years of age, you ought to know how much has changed. And even younger than that, but at least 50 years of age. Who would have ever thought we'd be to the place where we wouldn't know what bathroom to go into? Who would have ever thought we would have gay parades marching down the streets? Who would have ever thought it would be a sin to be white? I, 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 there's things I don't understand, I can't comprehend. Uh, I, who would have ever thought that the world that we're living in, the, the country that we're living in, the greatest country in the world, would debate the goodness of socialism? Who would have ever thought these kind of things would have existed? If you're 50 years and older, you know what kind of a world we were born in, and you ought to be able to see what's changed. But even if you're just 20 and 30 years of age, just what is changing in the headlines every single day, every single year, every single decade, ought to let you know we're in a great, great battle. And I'm not going to say we're losing the battle because we know how the battle is going to end. It's going to end with us being taken off this planet. But as far as the control of this world, the control of the bodies, the demonism that's in this world, it is growing in leaps and bounds. And if you don't want to be sucked into it, there's two things that you need to do, and I'll close with these two things. Number one, you need to be saved. You need to be saved, born again. I don't just mean have a religious experience. I mean you need to be saved from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. You need to fall in love with Jesus 110%. How do you get saved? Well, there's just two things that are required. Number one, you've got to believe what the Bible says about Jesus. You can't sidestep that. He's God. He was born in the flesh. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross. He rose on the third day, and he did that for you. The amazing thing is, most of the people I come into contact, they were born believing that. They don't make you saved. Just because you believe that doesn't mean you're saved. There's two things you've got to do to be saved. The second thing is the thing that kept me from heaven for three or four years. You've also got to repent. You've got to surrender yourself to Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean you'll be perfect, but it does mean you're going to walk a different road. You're going to walk the road where Jesus is the God, where he's got his hands on the steering wheel and you don't. You get in the back of the, you get in the trunk and you just let God drive, okay? Because that's what repentance is. It's letting God take us where God wants us to go. Those two things, I don't understand it. It's supernatural. But those two things, the surrender of self and the trust in Jesus Christ produce the new birth. If you've never experienced that, my friend, you need to do it today. And by the way, the test of whether or not you've done it, it's not that you got baptized, it's not that you're in church, it's not that you've got Sunday school pens or memorized Bible verses. The proof that you've done it is you're still changed. Jesus has still got his hands on the wheel and you're still in the back seat. If there's any other condition, you've got no reason to believe that you're going to heaven when you die. You say, but I, I lived a good life for five years, ten years. Matters not. If he's not driving the car today, there's no reason for you to believe he's ever saved your soul because there's no reason to believe you've ever repented. Two things you've got to do. Number one, you've got to be saved. Number two, you've got to be surrendered to Jesus Christ. I don't just mean an occasional attendance to church. Sunday morning. Maybe a Sunday night every once in a while. No, no, no. I'm talking about you really got to surrender to Jesus Christ. You've got to put yourself under the authority of the Word of God. You've got to start reading that book as though it's your lifeline because, friend, it is your lifeline. If there's any way you're going to survive this world, it's going to be through the teaching of that book right there. What I'm teaching today, what I'm preaching today about the devil, it's not deep theology. Hey, I'm not preaching deep this morning. It's important theology, but it's not deep theology. We're not talking about end times. We're not talking about prophecy. All you've got to do is just read that book and you know what I'm saying today is true. And yet I can tell you the truth. There's a lot of folks sitting here this morning. You've never, you've never read the book. You've never. Sometimes I'm amazed. I'll be teaching in Sunday school or preaching and I'll refer to a story in the Bible and you see eyes kind of light up. The shades kind of come on. You can tell. They've never read that before. Friend, you've got to read that book like it's your lifeline because it is your life. You've got to study it. You've got to live it. You've got to practice it. Those two things, salvation and surrender to God, that's how you can defeat the devil in your life. And it's how you can become an influence in the life of your children and of your grandchildren. And if you want to make a difference, the only way to make the difference is with Jesus Christ. I wish I could draw a picture. I wish I could paint one better with words to help us to understand 
that Satan, as a roaring lion, is walking all around you. And his goal is to destroy you and everything that is good in your life. Are you going to let him? Or are you going to get serious about Jesus Christ? Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the book, Plain and Simple. Help us to understand it and apply it to our lives. And cause that some this morning would make some decisions that they've never made before. We'll do our best to give you the praise for all that you do in this place. For we ask it in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If you have never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that means believed on Jesus and at the same time surrendered to Jesus. You say, I've never done that, preacher. Would you be honest enough just to lift your hand up? I'll pray for you. I'll not pray for you by name, but I'll pray for you this morning. You say, preacher, would you pray for me? I've never truly surrendered myself to Jesus Christ. Would you slip your hand up this morning? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach, and I pray that every person here is being honest. Now, Father, for the soul that may be further away from you than they realize, I pray that you would open their spirit and their mind today and help them to understand. For the Christian who's toying with sin, who's playing with sin, I pray, God, that you'd make the reality of what Satan wants to do in their life vivid in their minds, their hearts, their souls today. Again, we ask for changed directions. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ.